you to take your Bibles this morning and go with me to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. The Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapters 13 and 14, are what we're going to be looking at together today. And I'm going to start a series this morning. It's going to be a short series for the month of June, these few Sundays in the month of June. And I'm calling this series Unsung Heroes. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at some mighty men and women of God in Scripture that did great things for God, but you don't hear them talked about much. And we hear about the Abrahams, and we hear about the Moseses, and we hear about the Joshuas, and we hear about the Davids. And in the New Testament, we hear a lot about people like the Apostle Paul. But there are so many others in the Bible that we don't talk about nearly enough that did great things for God. And we're gonna be talking about one of these each week on each Sunday throughout the month of June. Next Sunday, Pastor Jamie is gonna be speaking. And she hasn't spoken here in a long, long time as far as on a Sunday morning. And so you don't wanna miss that. And she has uh, an unsung hero that she's gonna be talking to you about. But today, as we start this series, I I wanna... talk to you about one of my favorite heroes in the Bible. And maybe Jonathan Dodd won't get a big head with me talking about this today, but I want to talk to you today about Jonathan. Unsung unsung hero number one that we're going to talk about today is Jonathan. Now, we've heard a lot about John the Baptist in the New Testament. We've heard a lot about the Apostle John, who was also John the Revelator, But we don't hear very much about this courageous, strong, mighty warrior in the Old Testament. And do you know what the name Jonathan means? It means Jehovah's gift. And I reminded Tammy today that Jonathan is God's gift (laughs) to her. That's what the name means. And Jonathan was just that. Jonathan was a gift from God to the nation of Israel. Jonathan was the firstborn son of the first king of Israel, a man by the name of Saul. Saul was anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 10. He was anointed to be the first king over Israel by a prophet by the name of Samuel who went on behalf of the Lord and poured the oil on Saul's head and anointed him to become the first king over Israel. And Saul would rule over, king, over Israel for somewhere between 20 and 22 years. And listen to what the Bible tells us in, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 52. It says that all the days of Saul, Saul would rule 20 to 22 years over the nation of Israel. And all the days of Saul, all those days that added up to 20 to 22 years, all the days of Saul, there was bitter war with the Philistines. Now, I don't think I have to tell you, again, I've told you before, that the Philistines were the nemesis to the nation of Israel. You remember when God brought the nation of Israel when they finally got into the promised land, God intentionally left a few of those nations in the promised land. He didn't drive them out himself. He, he intentionally left a few nations in the promised land, and it was the responsibility of the Israelites to drive those remaining nations out of the promised land. And They didn't have much of an issue with some of those nations, but the Philistines just wouldn't leave. They just wouldn't leave. Matter of fact, the Philistines today would be the Palestinians. And there's still conflict. There's still tension between the Jewish people, the the Israelites, and the Palestinians. But they, they were Israel's nemesis. And really, Israel had gotten to the point to where they were just content. Most of them were just content to just let the Philistines stay in the promised land. Well, the problem with that is this. They eventually became subject to the Philistines. They they eventually became oppressed to those Philistines. And, And we begin the story here in... 
1 Samuel chapter 13, look at verse 2. It says that Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. Now, when Saul first became king and he summoned all those who were willing to fight, 300,000 men showed up. But now Saul chooses out of those 300,000, he chooses some special forces. And it numbers about 3,000. And it says that Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with his son Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. This is the first time that we are introduced to Saul's firstborn son, Jonathan. Jonathan is about 30 years old at this particular time in his life. He is a commander in his father's army. And listen to me. He is brave. He is courageous. He is a strong warrior. He is the complete opposite of his father. Saul was faithless. Jonathan was faithful. Saul was selfish. Jonathan was selfless. Saul was full of pride, but Jonathan was humble. For Saul, everything was about him. But with Jonathan, everything was about God. And he was a loyal soldier for the Lord. And we're introduced to him for the very first time here in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And let me tell you something about Jonathan. He was one of those who had had enough of the Philistines. He was sick and tired of being subject to the Philistines. He was sick and tired of being oppressed by those Philistines. I wonder if there's anybody here this morning who is sick and tired of being subject to your enemy, the devil. I wonder if there's anybody like Jonathan here this morning who is sick and tired of being oppressed by your enemy, the devil. There may be some people that's just content to just let the devil have his place. Don't stir him up. Don't get anything started. Let's just try to keep things quiet. Let's just try to keep things peaceful. That was not Jonathan. Jonathan said, I've had enough of these Philistines, and even if my daddy's not going to do anything about it, it's not going to stop me. So notice what he does. The moment that his father gives him a thousand men as a part of his troops, soon after that, Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of Philistines at Geba. Now, let me tell you what he does. He picks a fight with the Philistines. That's what he does. This is the first battle in many battles that would end with victory when David becomes king, but the first of many battles for the freedom, for the liberation of the nation of Israel from the Philistines. And it started with Jonathan. That's pretty awesome. And it says that Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of Philistines at Geba. And the news spread quickly among the Philistines. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land saying, Hebrews, hear this. Rise up in revolt. And all Israel heard, look at this, that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Gibeah. Notice Saul is taking credit for the victory that was won by his son, Jonathan. You, you would think that he would be so proud of his son, Jonathan, that he would recognize him as the one who led his troops to victory over the Philistines. But this is the kind of person that Saul is. He's even so jealous of his son that you'll see as you study that story that on two different occasions, he tries to kill his own son, Jonathan. But he takes credit for the victory that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba and that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. And let me tell you something, they hated them. 
But now they hate the Philistine, or now they hate the Israelites more than they've ever hated them before. And so the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. So here's what Saul does. He says, Jonathan, I want you to get your thousand men. I'm going to take my 2,000 men, and we're going to all come together. And we'll have a total now of about 3,000 men to go and fight the Philistines. Well, here's the problem with that. Verse 5, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots. They had as many chariots as Israel did soldiers. And 6,000 charioteers because there's two men in every chariot. And then notice this, soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Now, how would you feel? One minute, you might be feeling pretty good that we got 3,000 special forces here, but now all of a sudden, the odds are against us. We're looking at an army that has 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and, and an army the size of the sand of the seashore. And it says that they went up and camp, the Philistines did, at Michmash. We'll talk about Michmash in just a moment. East of Beth Avon. And then notice what happens in verse 6. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed. Notice this now. When they saw that the odds were against them. When they saw that they were in a tight spot. Now, let me just ask you something. What does the Bible say about how we are to live our lives as Christians? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are to live by faith and not by sight. But what are they doing? They are living by sight and not by faith. Because when they saw their circumstances and that the odds were against them, do you know what they forgot? They forgot whose side they were on. And they forgot who was on their side, that God was with them, that God was on their side and they were on God's side. But they're looking at this from a human perspective. And it says that when they saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, look at how they respond. They hid in caves, thickets, rocks, pits, cisterns. Anywhere there was a place to hide, they were finding a place to hide. And the ones that didn't hide, notice it said that some of them crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. In other words, they're fleeing, they're going AWOL. They're not running to the battle, they're running away from the battle. They're not running to the enemy, they're running from the enemy. And it says that Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking in fear. So you've got a large number of them hiding. You've got another large number of them. They've run. And the ones that's left, they're standing there just quaking. Quaking in fear. And this leads Saul to do something that displeases the Lord. He gets impatient. And instead of inquiring of the Lord, he takes matters into his own hands. And when you go down to verse 11, Samuel confronts him. And Samuel says to him, Saul, what have you done? And Saul replied, when I saw. Again, we don't live by sight. We live by faith in God. But notice he said, because I was going by what I saw and measuring my response by how I could respond to what I saw, I saw that the odds were against me. But notice he said, when I saw that the men were scattering, I mean, they were hiding, they were going this way, they were going that way, and I knew that if I didn't, if I didn't do something sooner or later, I wasn't going to have an army left. I wasn't going to have any men left. And he said, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time. Yes, yes, Samuel did come at the set set time. Samuel had told Saul to wait on him for seven days. 
And Samuel showed up before the seventh day was over. But how many of you know sometimes God shows up at the last second? And it's a test for us as to whether or not we're going to trust him. God's delays are not God's denials. You've heard that before. And we need to be reminded of that this morning. But he said, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you didn't come at the appointed or at the set time, really what Saul is saying is when you didn't show up at the time I thought you should show up. I got impatient. I took matters into my own hands. He said the, the Philistines were assembling at, at Michmash. And I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. And I've not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. But that's not your responsibility, Saul. That's not the responsibility of the king. That's the responsibility of the prophet. That's the responsibility of the priest. And Samuel goes on and he tells Saul, you have disobeyed the Lord. And because of your disobedience, you've displeased the Lord. And he's going to rip the kingdom from you. And he's going to give it to somebody who has a heart for him. Referring to David, that David would be the next anointed king over Israel. And even in this, we see what a great man Jonathan was. Because as the firstborn son of Saul, Jonathan was the rightful heir to the throne. He knew that David was going to be anointed to the next king of Israel. He could have gotten jealous. He could have gotten angry. He could have gotten bitter. He could have gotten resentful because David got a position that was rightfully his. But do you know what Jonathan did? Jonathan entered into a blood covenant relationship with David and said, David, I just want you to know I'm your friend. I want you to know that as long as you're alive and you're on the face of this earth, and as long as I'm alive and on the face of this earth, I've got your back. I've got your back. I'm going to make sure you're taken care of. I'm going to make sure every member of your family is taken care of he was a loyal friend but the kingdom has been ripped will eventually be ripped away from Saul because of his disobedience and when we go to verse 15 it says that Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin and Saul started counting how many men he had left and they numbered about 600 that means either that, that means that 2400 of his soldiers are either hiding or they've deserted and the 600 that he has left are quaking in fear what an army to face such a, such a massive enemy and the bible tells us after this that the Philistines then put together their special forces and they split them into four different groups and they begin to strategically position themselves at outposts to prepare themselves for the battle that they are about to face with the Israelites. And then the scripture tells us this in verse 19 of 1 Samuel 13, that not a blacksmith could be found in the land of Israel. You say, what does this have to do with anything? Just hang on. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said otherwise the Hebrews will make swords and spears. This shows us just how oppressed the Israelites were to the Philistines. That the Philistines did not even allow the Israelites to have blacksmiths because they knew that if they had blacksmiths then they would have the ability to form, to make themselves weapons to fight with. And they even charged the Israelites exorbitant prices because when they needed to have their farm tools sharpened, they would have to take them to the Philistines and go to the blacksmiths in the Philistines to have their shovels and their picks and their axes and those kind of things sharpened. Not a blacksmith. You say, well, why would God do this to the nation of Israel? Because, it, but, but because the Philistines, they had all the technology to form the most powerful weapons of that day. That's why they were such a formidable foe. And you would say, well, why would God allow the Philistines to have all of those weapons and the Israelites don't have any? Because listen, listen to what the Bible says, on the day of battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand. That only Saul and his son Jonathan had a sword. So now you got 598 men 
Not only are they quaking in fear, they don't have a weapon. And if they do have a weapon, it's an ax or a shovel or a pick. You say, well, why would God do this? Why would God not give the Israelites the weapons that they would need, but yet the Philistines seem to have every weapon that you can possibly imagine? Well, you have to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. When David has been anointed king and he's going out to fight the biggest, baddest Philistine of all, you know him as Goliath. And Goliath, as that Philistine, comes out with all of those weapons that only the Philistines could have. David comes out with nothing but a sling because that was one weapon that the Israelites had was a sling. And many of them were skilled with a sling. But a sling doesn't do you very much good in hand-to-hand combat. And so when David goes out to do battle against Goliath, here's what he says. He says, Goliath, when this fight is over today... Everybody here is going to know that God does not save by a sword and a spear or a spear because the battle is the Lord's and today he is going to deliver you into our hands. And that's what God is teaching these Israelites. You don't need swords. You don't need spears. You've got me on your side and I'm going to deliver the enemy into your hands. Oh, somebody give God some praise in the house. It only gets better because the Bible says, then a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash, the place where Saul had been. Now the Philistines have a stronghold, an outpost at Michmash. We'll show you why Michmash was so important here in just a moment. So you got this detachment of Philistines at Michmash. And then we go to 1 Samuel chapter 14. And here's, and we just continue this story. Man, I'm telling you, I know what's coming. I'm getting excited. I, I love this story right here in 1 Samuel chapter 14. It says, one day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. He said, I'm not going to wait for my daddy to take action. And I'm not even going to wait for the enemy to take action. He said, I'm going to go ahead and take some initiative and we're going to take the offensive and we're going to go to where that Philistine outpost is. And he looks at his armor bearer and he says, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. Well, it says that Saul, Jonathan's father, was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. And as we saw in chapter 13, with him were about 600 men. So where are they? When Jonathan's telling his armor bearer, come on, let's get up, let's go fight. Saul and his 600 men are laying under a pomegranate tree, shaking and quaking in fear, doing absolutely nothing about the enemy. Listen to me this morning. I know we talk about generational sins. I know we talk about generational iniquities. I know that we talk about generational curses. But what this tells me is just because your great-grandfather or your grandfather or your father was one way doesn't mean that you have to follow the example of your father. And Jonathan said, nope, that ain't who I want to be. And Jonathan broke that curse. Jonathan broke that generational iniquity. Jonathan broke that generational sin over his family. He said, my daddy may be a coward, but just because my daddy's a coward don't mean I have to be a coward. Oh, somebody should say praise God right there. Notice something else it says in verse 3. Also with Saul was Ahijah who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahijah, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. So notice what, notice what Saul has with him here. He has the priest. And, and you'll find out later in the story. We're not going to look at the scripture, but later in the story, they had the Ark of the Covenant with them. How many of you know that Paul said in the last days, That one of the signs of the last days that that people would have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Saul looked the part, had the priest with him. The priest had the ephod. In the ephod was a pouch with a couple of stones. 
called the Urim and the Thummim. And they would take those stones out and it would be like casting lots to determine what the will of God is. So he had the priest with him. He had the Ark of, Ark of the Covenant with him. The outward appearance, it seemed like Saul was a man of God. It seemed like Saul was doing everything right. But listen to me, you can have all of that, but if you don't have faith in God, if your trust is not in God, you can have a form of godliness, but no power whatsoever. And that's Saul. And notice what it says. It says that no one was aware that Jonathan had left. So in verse 4, it says on each side of the pass. Remember now, he's going to Michmash. And on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. So it's a very narrow pass that he's going through. On one side is a huge cliff. On the other side is a huge cliff. One of the cliffs was called Bozes, and the other cliff was called Sine. Bozes means slippery. Sine means thorny. So it didn't matter which side of that cliff you were going to climb up. It was going to be a difficult climb. It was either going to be slippery or it was going to be full of thorns. And verse 5 says that one cliff stood to the north toward Michmash and the other to the south toward Geba. Now you would think that when, when Jonathan thinks about all that they're going to have to go through to get to the enemy that he would kind of back down. But no, verse 6, this is the best verse in the whole chapter. It says that Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised men. Uncircumcised referred to those Philistines and it referred to people who were not in covenant with God because the sign of the covenant was circumcision. And here's what Jonathan understands. He understands those Philistines don't have God on their side. Those Philistines, they worship all kind of false gods, but they don't worship the true one God of heaven and earth. He said, they're not in covenant with him, but we are. We are God's covenant people. And God has covenanted with us that he would never leave us and he would never forsake us, but that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. Oh, we're seeing, what we're seeing in this verse is the kind of faith that Jonathan had in God. And he said, come, let's go over. Let's not wait for the enemy to come to us. Let's go to the enemy. Let's not wait for daddy and those troops under that pomegranate tree that are over there shaking in fear. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that if you're going to be a good leader of the people, you've got to be willing willing to do what other people are not willing to do because nothing gets done. This is a real principle of leadership. Nothing gets done until somebody provides leadership for it. And Jonathan understands that. This has been an issue for years and years and no one has done anything about it. And Jonathan says, I'm tired of it. And he takes action. Come. Come. Let's go over. And then notice the next thing he says in this verse. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. What? Perhaps? If you were this armor bearer, and David is asking you to go into a battle where you're going to be, the the odds are, are completely against you. And you're not even certain how things are going to turn out. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Let me tell you something. This is not a statement of weak faith. This is a statement of great faith. Because you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were standing before King Nebuchadnezzar and King Nebuchadnezzar told him, if you don't bow down to the image of Babylon in the middle of the city, when the music begins to play, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. They refused to bow. And so they confronted the king and the king said to them, if you promise me this won't happen again, 
I'll let, you, I'll let it slide this time. But they looked at him and said, oh, king, we don't, we don't even need any more time to think about it. You go ahead and make your threats. We're not going to bow down to your God because we serve a God who is able to deliver us. But you know what the very next thing was they said? But even if he doesn't, we still aren't going to worship your gods. We're, we're still going to continue to worship him. Even if he doesn't come through, even if he doesn't deliver us, even if we are burnt to a crisp in that fiery furnace, we're not sure how things are going to work out, but we're going to keep trusting God. Oh, somebody ought to just be praising the Lord in the house today. He said, perhaps, listen, he had so much faith in God that he was willing to step out on a maybe. Let me ask you this morning, is there anybody in this house today that's just willing to step out on a maybe? Yeah. Esther, Esther was willing to step out on a maybe. And she said, if I perish, I perish. I don't know how things are going to end up, but all I know is this is God's will. And I'm going to make sure if I die, I die doing the will of God and not being disobedient to the will of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then notice what he says. He says, come, let's go over. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. And then the third thing he says is, I, I do know this. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. That's so what he's telling his armor bearer. He's saying, listen, whether it's 300,000, whether it's 3,000, whether it's 600 or armor bearer, whether it's just you and me. I, I just know this, that the Lord can say, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or few. Can I tell you, we need some Jonathans in the kingdom of God today with this kind of faith that knows that nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. He doesn't need a lot of people to work through, but if he can just get a few people with faith in him, he can turn this world upside down. Oh, hallelujah. I got to hurry and get through this. Verse seven, his armor bearer looked back at him. This was his response. Do all that you have in mind. I am with you, heart and soul. Wow. Every pastor dreams of armor bearers like that. We go and don't know how it's going to turn out, but I know God can save. Are you ready? Ready. Heart and soul. And then verse 8 says, Jonathan said to the armor bearer, well, come on then, and we'll cross over toward them and let them see us. What? <laughs> now, now, that doesn't sound like a very good strategy to me. I mean, a good military strategy to me would be more, would be more covert than overt. You know, you want to try to sneak up behind your enemy and, and that, that element of surprise. But Jonathan said, we're going to let those Philistines, we're going to let them see us. And then, then notice verse 9, and he said, if they say to us, you wait down there, because remember, they're at the bottom of the cliff. And he said, if they say to you, wait, wait there until we come to you, he said, we're going to stay where we are, and we're not going to go up to them. But then notice what he says, but if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that'll be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Now, I think I'd have had to negotiate with the Lord a little bit right here. Be like, Lord, they got the high ground. They have the advantage on us. So God, bring them down to where we are. That'll be my sign. But no, the sign was, if they say, you come up here to us, then we'll know that that's the sign from God that he has given them into our hands. And you know that those that have the upper ground have the advantage, especially when one side of that cliff is slippery and the other side of that, that cliff is full of briars and thorns. But he said... If they say to us, come up to us, we're going to climb up because that's going to be our sign. The Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them, Jonathan and the armor bearer, showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. And look at what the Philistines said when they saw them. Look, said the Philistines, those Hebrews, you know, that were hiding. He said, they're crawling out of the holes. 
that they were hiding in. Oh, they just didn't know who they were dealing with. Jonathan never hid. Jonathan never thought about hiding. Neither did his armor bearer. Jonathan didn't flee. And Jonathan never thought about fleeing. But they showed themselves and they said, look, they're, they're crawling out of those holes that they were hiding in. And the men of the outpost shouted exactly what Jonathan wanted to hear. They shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you boys a lesson. What they didn't know is that Jonathan and his armor bearer had some Alabama blood in them. (laughs) They didn't know who they were picking a fight with, right? They said, climb up to us. We're going to teach you a lesson. Listen, they were so arrogant. They were so confident in themselves that they, they could have with their, with their weapons, they could have taken care of Jonathan and his armor bearer while they're coming up that hill. But they're so confident. They're going to wait. We'll wait till y'all get up here. We ain't afraid of you. We'll wait for you. And it says, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, and I love this, climb up after me. Because most of us would say, armor bearer, you go first. But that's not what leaders do. Did you hear me? That's not what leaders do. Leaders are not afraid to go first. They're not afraid to lead the way. God help us, we need some leaders in the kingdom of God today that'll go where no one has ever gone before and say, hey, follow me, I'll go first. He said, climb up after me. He said, the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And it said that Jonathan climbed up, look at this, using his hands and his feet. Here's what that tells me. He's got to put his sword away, and he's the only one other than Saul that even has one. And he has to put his sword away, and with his hands and his feet, he has to climb up that cliff along with his armor bearer right behind him. But notice, when they got to the top top of that cliff, the the Philistines began to fall before Jonathan, and his armor bearer followed him and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in about a half of an acre. And let me tell you something, when you've got that kind of faith, it's going to inspire some people. And do you know who that kind of faith inspires more than anybody else? That kind of faith inspires God. And it gets God moving on your behalf. And verse 15 says, then a panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp and field and those in the outpost and raiding raiding parties. And the ground shook. God sent an earthquake. It was a panic sent by God. Because I told you, it is not with a sword and a spear that we're going to win over our enemy. This battle belongs to God. Oh, somebody shout amen this morning. Hallelujah. It was a panic sent by God. And I'm about to close. But back in Gibeah, Saul has his men as watchmen on the tower. And they're watching all of this from a distance. And it says that Saul's lookouts at Gibeah and Benjamin saw the Philistine army melting away in all directions. Then Saul said to the men who were with him, muster the forces and see who has left us. And when they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. And you know Saul had to say, oh Lord, not again. What am I going to do with this boy? He's constantly stirring up the enemy. He found out that Jonathan, his son, was gone. Then Saul and all his men assembled and went to the battle. Because see, not only is God inspired by that kind of faith, even the faithless are inspired by that kind of faith. And when they got to the battlefield, they found that the Philistines were in total confusion. Only God could do that. Striking each other with their own swords. The enemy done turned against themselves. And those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines, there were some that went AWOL. There were some that betrayed. There were some that stopped fighting with with the Israelites and went over and joined forces with the Philistines. But notice what happened. They now leave the Philistines. And go back to fight with Israel. 
Because we all want to be on the winning team, don't we? And when the Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines had gone up with them to their camp, they went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. And then look at this in verse 22. And when all those Israelites that was hiding in the hill country of Ephraim and heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in pursuit. You see, that kind of faith that Jonathan had inspired the faithless. Let me tell you why we need people like Jonathan today. Because the last, or or middle ways through chapter 14, verse 23 says, on that day, the Lord saved Israel. Notice it wasn't the 300,000 or the 3,000 or the 600, it wasn't even Jonathan and the armor bearer. It was God. That day, the Lord saved Israel. But look at this, but the battle moved on and the battle continues today that's why we need men and women like Jonathan because Jonathan teaches us a few things first of all Jonathan teaches us that if we will step up I wonder if there's anybody in this room here today who, like Jonathan, will say, I'll step up. I'm sick and tired of myself, my marriage, my family, my business, my finances. I'm sick and tired of being subject to and oppressed by the enemy. Nobody else may be stepping up, but I will step up. With faith in God, with confidence in God, with full trust in God. I wonder if there's anybody in this house here today who, like Jonathan, will say, yes, I'll step up. Because he teaches us another thing, that when we step up, God will step in. And that could be the only thing right now that's keeping God from stepping into your situation. It's because you haven't stepped up in faith, trust, confidence in God. But not only does he teach us that if we will step up, God will step in. But he teaches us that others will step out. You know, there are some that are just waiting to see what you do. What my response is going to be what your response is going to be. You know what? Your children, your children, they're waiting to see, well, what's what's mama going to do? What's daddy going to do? And when you step up in faith and God steps in, it's going to inspire others to step out. And I'm going to tell you, when that happens, We outnumber our enemy. And we need to be all in this, in in, in this all together, don't we? I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. (laughs) And listen, I'm not not going to just preach about these characters each week just so we can see how brave they were and how courageous they were, what warriors they were. No. I'm praying that what caused them to be great in the eyes of God, that we will say, God, I want you to do the same thing in my life. I want to be that, I, I want to be that kind of person like Jonathan that you can use God to bring victory to my life, to bring victory to my marriage, to bring victory to my family, bring victory to my finances. Is there anybody here this morning that is sick and tired of the oppression of the enemy. Anybody? Let me, let me see your hand. Are you, are you sick and tired? Those of you who got your hand up, get up here right now. Get up here to the front of this building. Is there anybody here this morning that said, I'm, with, I'm, I'm ready right now to step up because I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Come on, let's sing a little bit more of that song we ended with. It's your breath in our lungs, Lord. So we pour out our praise 
We need to understand every resource. Everything comes from God today. Amen? And our faith should be in Him. Our trust should be in Him. When I study all of these characters, do you know what the common denominator is with all of these that did great things for God? Faith! So I want to pray today that as you step out, that God will increase your faith in Him. Amen. I'm telling you, you're looking at a person here right now. I, I, I believe there is absolutely nothing impossible for God to do. I've seen God to do too many things in my own life and in the, in the lives of others to ever doubt God. Amen. So it doesn't matter how big the task may seem. It doesn't matter how formidable the enemy may look. Listen, if you'll have faith in God and if you'll let that faith drive you, if you will be, let that faith be what causes you to be obedient to God, then when you step up, God will step into your situation. And God will do what only God can do.